Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan. Joining me is Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome back, listeners. Good to have you guys back. Good to be back, Zaki. And we're actually sitting here in the presence of each other, which is rare. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 I've almost forgot how you look like. Which well, we can't stand good. each other. That's kind of the, the <laughs> dirty secret of the show. We're like Laverne and Shirley, the final season. They had to record them separately or something? Yeah, they they can they hated each other. Or, like, remember Three's Company, like, when, when Suzanne Summers left? Right. They would she, do, like, the Chrissy phone call. Are we supposed to talk about Three's Company on the show? Why so, you know, Archie Punjabi hated uh, uh, Julianna yeah, Margulies? Yeah, that's right, on The Good Wife, yeah. right? And so they, they, recorded ha- they had separately. to record separately and then digitally Did insert you know them this? later. I heard it on your podcast. Yeah, yeah. Your sister, you, our, our sister podcast, movie the film. movie film podcast. By the way. <laughs> it's because Archie uh, got to fame too quick and got nominated before Juliana. So, which one's Juliana? Which one's Archie? Juliana is from uh, which? From oh, ER. No, no. How about you? ER. Of you guys? Oh, I don't know. Hey, I, I can see Zucky doing that to you, Pervez. <laughs> oh, in a heartbeat, I'd drop him like a bag of dirt. Are you kidding me? He knows it too. He just replaces you. He yeah. just replaces you with another uh, hipster uncle. This young I, uncle. I, I would, I would wait, find somebody who else. Named? Claim, wait, who, who rose to flame earlier or too soon and then uh, like so, left so, the other behind? So, you so, said Archie did. No, Archie got nominated first. First, okay. And so even though Juliana was on the perch, she felt threatened by Archie's gotcha. rise. So that then you'd be Archie. I'd be Juliana. Be, no, you'd be Archie. I've been really? in the trenches for like 30 freaking years. Oh, okay. And who gets the White House invite? You do. That's a good point. <laughs> and you can sense the bitterness there, too. <laughs> I know. Wow. It's coming out. Hey, dude, it was Obama. If he got the invite now, I'd be like... <laughs> if I got the invite, I, I wouldn't go. Like, right no now. one cares who got the invite, but who got it first? <laughs> Yo, Zaki. So that's Bajaj Atali, whose voice... You, I didn't do the intro for him. Bajaj's Bajaj playing like armchair, you know, uh, I'm just psychi- I'm trying psychiatrist to be for us. I'm trying to get them to kill each other by the end <laughs> of this episode. This is the end of Diffuse, Diffuse Congruence. congruence after dark. I'm trying to see like fitna. How much fitna can I cause? Like how much innate jealousy and like ill will can well, you don't need <laughs> that's been the, hidden beneath the, the surface the, of brotherly love. The truth is that if you were to read our text conversations, you don't need to start much fitna. I'm you mean. Should, I know. I, I, I'm very passive aggressive. Like at any given time, I get a text from Pervez and I'm pretty sure it's like Gatti. Like at that moment, he's like, you know what? I'm, I'm done. I've had it. Gatti? Is it? Wow, he went Gatti, man. Gatti, man. That's, that's Gatti my, is hardcore. He's hardcore. That's a deep cut. We're, we're related through marriage. That's the only reason that that's we're, we stand we're each other. I can see Pervez as like the quintessential like Hyderabadi like proper noam, meaty churi type of like you know like the <laughs> sweet knife. Is like oh so being overweight is in season now. And you're like what? Did you just call me fat? Of course not. Now, that's a nice hat to hide your baldness. It's like I can see Pervez just like death by a thousand past progressive <laughs> hydro is that, is cuts. That apt, Pervez? <laughs> it is very apt. Oh, there we go. You nailed okay. it. If my wife ever listens to an episode, she would totally agree with John. If, 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 if my wife listens. <laughs> Pervez, because Pervez is like God-fearing man and like, you know, a father, but you could tell like that bitterness is there. Like if he wasn't religious and grounded, like he could be an ISIS general. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> but like a smart one, you know, like the Baghdadi who has like religious education, who can ground it in like hadith. I'm not sure what kind of compliment yeah, I, that is. I don't, I don't I, know how to take that. Because Zaki would be like the, the nerd boy yeah. recruiter on Twitter, right? Like, Thank yeah. you. <laughs> be like, yo, but like Pervez would be like the general. He'd be like, let me tell you the theological <laughs> background of why you're kafir. <laughs> Excellent. But you have a nice, yeah. but you have a nice head of hair. At least I know I have a good gig waiting for me. There you yeah. go. Yeah. So we went from the learning truly to ISIS recruits. <laughs> wow, that's we're running the gamut here. That's right. That's right. So, so again, this thank is, you this for is, having me. Yeah, this is this is what I had. This is his second time on the show. Second time, right? Yes. Se- it'd be second this, yeah. time. The the first time was you know the first time we had you on. You were still at Al Jazeera. Yes. And this is true. and. Um, I remember was, doing it from my apartment in Virginia. You okay, were, so before then, we had a kid, I think. Yes. Oh, was, is that right? Yes. Okay. And and we were discussing uh, uh, Dia Barakat and, and uh, that had just happened. That had wow. just happened. Yeah. That's very shortly there. So yeah. that's like the, so that would have been 2015. Yeah, February. I think two years ago. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah, so February. so uh, about two years apart. Okay. So so we we are recording uh, uh, here in the San Clara Convention Center. You're in town for the. Uh, open conference and so we got some FaceTime with you do, do the do listeners know what open is? I was just about to say for, the, for those who don't know well I was going to say like yeah. maybe you can so open is uh, open Silicon Valley is uh, like the Voltron uh, of all the wealthy Pakistani uncles who would never give us the time of day who I think five or ten years ago we can easily say were like a bunch of <laughs> but now are 
<laughs> we've never had to. <laughs> That's gonna be a bleep. Can That's gonna be a bleep. bleep. Out. But uh, Indian profanity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, we've had f F F F bombs dropped. Yeah. So you, you're gonna never have to bleep to... this out because like I talked to an open uncle and he's like, "Yeah, you're right. Like ten years ago, we were." But now we're like you know more engaged. So basically, it's like all these wealthy, mashallah, yeah. immigrant. Pakistani entrepreneurs who made it and for like the last 10 like they've been evolving but like when we used to go like 10 years ago it used to be kind of like I'm wealthy you're not let me tell you why I'm not but now it's become more engaged and integrated they have youth there it's like much more of a solid conference and I think they've gone from 400 people to 1,000 people they have some very influential people giving speeches good networking and so we are now competing with a shoe conference a sneaker shoe it's conference true. and all the kids of the open uncles have <laughs> left open to try to sneak into the sneaker conference that's happening and uh, we're in the parking lot at apparently Levi Stadium I've finally seen this monstrosity up close oh yeah you've never I've never been, been so oh that's right this is interesting but Great America's still here so that's yes, good yes it is yeah. still here and now there's a Borchi Indian restaurant across the street so we're oh, making it's, our, called yeah. it's called Borchi <laughs> it's called Borchi yeah, it's called Borchi it's called Borchi yeah. Indian yeah. cuisine no it is it is it's, yeah. see I'm like but it's like you're just lying I'm like no nope, <laughs> I drove by it today yeah so that's open. So, so this is uh, by happenstance. We're recording on the hundredth day of the Trump administration. Oh, yeah. This is day one hundred. Mashallah. Yeah. <laughs> and Stop and for a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, now it's it's funny, right? Because th- there's been a lot of talk over the past couple of days about, oh man, he hasn't gotten anything done over the past hundred days. What a joke! And I'm kind of like, isn't it a good thing that he hasn't gotten anything done? I mean, that's isn't no. that. Pretty that, much that's something we should give like two That's namaz. like the best case yeah. scenario in this whole thing, isn't that's it? That's right. Yes and no. And so, mm. so, w- look, the president of the United States still is the commander in chief of the nation of three hundred plus million people of what used to be the most powerful nation on earth. Mm. And for whether we like it or not, he is the representative uh, on the international stage of our country. Um, his his belligerent tweets, his his idiotic flip flopping, his lack of temperament make us look like, you know, like we're a bunch of jokers and clowns. And they're having effect on the international market. They're having effect on foreign policy. So in a way, yes, I'll let their sugar that, like, you know, the core of his ideological policies have failed. Let's let's do a checklist. First day, I'm going to repeal and replace Obamacare. That's right. Nope. Complete yeah. failure. And in fact, the replacement that you came up with was hated by your own party. I'm going to do a Muslim ban. Block twice. Mm-hmm. Doesn't seem it's going to go through. Uh, three, lock her up. She's not locked up. You're probably going to play golf with her uh, in four years or when you resign uh, or get kicked out. Uh, fourth, m- uh, the Mexican wall. Build the wall. Yeah, yeah, which this week finally, you know, he tried to threaten uh, the Democrats and say tit for tat funding. You know, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to take away the Is Obama it, subsidies. A dollar of funding yeah. for Obamacare for a dollar of funding for the wall. And Democrats said F you and Republicans themselves said nope. And what happened? He's like, okay, okay, I'm going to let the government go on for one more week and approve of this, you know, this, this, this spending bill. But it seems unlikely that's going to happen. Um, infrastructure development. He, remember he said, like, I'm going to do, like, trillion dollars worth of in- infrastructure investment, which would, got him, which, have got, which would have gotten him bipartisan support. You saw his budget. He was actually taking money away from the infrastructure right. and Rust Belt development. Mm-hmm. And so across the board... Uh, yes, in a way, oh, alhamdulillah, his most odious racist policies are failing. But we still have him in, as president. We still have Republicans who haven't abandoned him. Republicans are still governors. And his base, only 2% of his base, 2%, yeah. uh, said they have buyer's regret. And so, well, well, oh, I mean, so, I mean, it just shows you, like, in one way, yes, thank God we're, we're not building a wall and getting deported <coughs> in Muslim camps. But in other ways, but, but like... That, I mean, that, that okay, so... so the, the, the the Muslim camps thing, which kind of made for black humor, I guess, during the campaign, that was always a, uh, you know, it was a reach in terms of, mm. right, I mean, in terms of, the, it, it was a rhetorical reach, and that that's not something that even he was talking about. So I traveled, can I just say, interject, so I've been deliberately doing this dark humor joke across America. I went to the DNC convention in Philadelphia and talked to Trump supporters. I went to... I saw uh, that. That was on... Uh, HuffPo. Yeah, it was I on HuffPo. It was, I was in, video. I was in Maine at a Trump rally where I was the literally the only reporter, like two weeks before the election, hmm. and the only person of color. And on Twitter and on email, very well-known, respected journalists literally said, this is the first time this ever happened to me, be safe. Wow. Just to go... Uh, respected people. I'm talking about non-Muslims, right? Mm-hmm. I openly said this. I said, okay, if Trump wins, will you go visit me in the camps? And his supporters... And even some Bernie brothers, you like, ha, 
he's not gonna do that. Okay, I'll play this game with you. Like, kind of dark, cathartic humor to get. Sure. After the election, I deliberately do this joke again at speeches. And there used to be like a ha ha mm -hmm, beforehand. No one laughs now. Mm -hmm. No one. Like, across America. It's almost as if this might happen. Hmm. Um, and that's something, because people forget, dude, he said he went permanent Muslim ban, then he changed it to temporary Muslim ban, then he said Muslim, extreme vetting of Muslims, but this is the thing that people forget. He entertained a Muslim registry. That's right. Right. People always forget that. Yeah. And we're in the 75th anniversary of the American internment of Japanese uh, American citizens. Mm -hmm. People forget that him and his surrogates actually favorably refer to the internment of American right. Japanese. He, he, he himself did as well. People forget this because he's done so much crazy crap. People say, well, look what FDR did with the executive order. And uh, they've named bridges after him. And so this is something like Steve Bannon's still there, Steve Millen's, Steve Miller's still there, Jeff Sessions is still there. It, we have to, in my humble opinion, uh, be very vigilant. Sure. Mm -hmm. And Sorry, I, I didn't want to go on a tangent, but you no, brought I that think up. An, I think it's an important point. And, the, I mean, and the Japanese internment is still good law you know, on the books. Korematsu was... Uh, Korematsu know, has never been, you know... Uh, <laughs> yeah. The Supreme Court ruled against him. That's right. And then Bill Clinton then apologized, but Pirby... Pirby, yeah, and it's yeah. still good law. Yeah. Right? It's still precedent. Huh. And it's an executive order. Yeah. And it was done uh, under the auspices of... National, secu war, war, national war, security. National security. Uh, espionage. You can't trust them. That's right. And uh, America went with yeah. it. Exactly. So we're not that most... Like, all it takes sometimes is... And I'm an optimist, but I'm, I'm a pragmatist also. Yeah. Like, it just takes one guy who looks like us to, to do something Allah crazy. Wakbar. Yeah, and do something insane. That's it. That's right. Yeah. Especially with this president. I mean, people are almost talking about it in hushed tones. Yeah, no. But just imagine. We're well, and, I mean, one I mean, terrorist attack yeah, away well, and, from and, God knows and what. And I think, I think it was Michael Moore last week or something. was like, I'm terrified about the right stag fire that's you know there you go. which is i mean when you talk about hush tones i think i think everyone in the muslim community has that concern of god forbid i mean that's an existential con you know what i mean that sure, that is no ex an existential concern for the muslim community but, so, or for, for i so, think but however here's here's and and this is i think a devil's advocate thing just as much as anything else i think that these past 100 days have shown why we have cause for concern, not just as Muslims, but as, as citizens, but also the strength of the system yeah. in that, in that, you know, when, when he was sworn in, there were think pieces like, why I'm terrified of the next hundred days or whatever. And the truth is what we've seen, you know, that litany that you listed, mm -hmm. the strict, the, the, the structure of our government is such that even people who you, who you might have vehement ideological disagreements with still Notwithstanding the president, but the other, uh, you know, the uh, the other houses, you know, the Senate and the House, well, more the Senate really, uh, are able to sort of tamp down on some of the extreme craziness. That's not to say something extreme couldn't slip through that, but definitely. No, so the, it's, it's the strength of the system and the strength of American democracy and our structures, despite, you know, the incompetence and the bloat and whatever criticism you have, is that there's resistance, like judges. Yeah. Judges are doing their job. Sitting on an island in the Pacific. Yeah, sitting yeah. on that island in the Pacific. I'm going to double down on and say another racist comment because I'm Jeff Sessions. But I say everything with a nice little southern accent, so I can't be racist, right? Because look at me. I look like a, the chief elf, a keyboard elf. Yeah, but and I, I'm a southern. So come on, y'all. Let's have marmalade sandwiches. Because <laughs> anyone like, who eats a like marmalade Smeagol, sandwich. Right? Am I the only one who thinks that? I is? think he looks like the head Keebler elf. Remember the Keebler elf commercial? Sure. Just, just oh, go yeah. back and look at it. He looks oh, yeah. like that guy with the without the topi though. For sure, without the topi. <laughs> but but you know that's that's something yeah. that I was having a conversation with someone recently. Is like you see the judges doing their jobs. Mm -hmm. You see even congressmen uh, within his own party. Yeah, uh, pushing back. That's right. uh, you're seeing the House Intelligence Another Committee. Perfect Southern gentleman, like uh, you know, what's his name? Uh, Lindsey. Uh, Lindsey Graham. Lindsey Graham. That's right. From South Carolina. South Carolina. That's right. Uh, or even the House Intelligence yeah. Committee, despite Nunez. That's right. Being shady as hell. <laughs> okay. Like, but he had to step back. Yeah. Enough pressure came, yeah. right? Yeah. And then even with the Senate, if they don't go for the nuclear option when it comes to legislation, which they might after it passed with Gorsuch, yeah. he still needs two thirds, yeah. which he doesn't have. What do you make right. of the inter like like I'm, I'm sorry to keep, but like what do you make of the internal shuffle within the White House in terms of like if there's this big feud between Kushner, oh, Jared, is. Jared Kushner, and and uh, Steve Bannon. Dude, dude, is this like a nufsy nufsy battle right. of spoiled, like uh, arrogant children? For sure. And what you're basically dealing with are smart people who do not have experience 
and competence in running a government. Right. That's the main problem. And so my friends who are in the State Department, my friends who are in like the Department of Justice, dude, like the, this is the leakiest administration in history. And these are many of them are Republicans. And because people are like, dude, it's like a total cluster F. Mm. Uh, a lot of these ed- positions aren't filled yet. Filled. Like people, like State Department people are just like, he's like in cafeterias, not knowing what to do with their days. <laughs> and then Tillerson said he might cut thousands of jobs. But then one part of it is ideological that they want to cut, cut, cut government. Another part is they literally are so incompetent, meaning they have zero experience in running a government that they don't even know how to fill these positions. That's right. Um, and then on top of all that, you have two very different ideological visions. Mm. Steve Bannon is a very dangerous ideologue who's very kula kulam open about his ideology. President Bannon is you. Yeah, yeah, President it, Bannon. You kind of helped get in the, thank you, thank President you. Trump yeah. See, because it pissed him off. And apparently... You were on part, CNN saying that. According yeah. to the leaks, apparently he got pissed off with people seeing President Bannon, so we removed him from the National Security Council. Jared Kushner is... Look, it's very interesting. We have a schizophrenic president who is fueled by narcissism, right. who has always been interested in his bottom line and supporting his name and his family name that's right who is a globalist who's a worldly person who's all about free market because it benefits him at the same time he married himself to the ideological vision of steve bannon far right white nationalism non-interventionism isolationism america first Mm -hmm. and so now you have these two visions Mm -hmm. an economic vision that benefits trump and all of his goldman sachs and uh, you know wall street friends including jared kushner with bannon if he yeah. abandons Bannon, he's going to abandon the Breitbart base. Right. And Bannon teased, like I was waiting for it, and it happened. It happened. Bannon, somehow Breitbart turned on Kushner. It, it, it. Why do you think that happened? Yeah. Why was Fire Kushner trending? Trump knows if he abandons Bannon, Breitbart's going to turn on him. Mm-hmm. But if he embraces Bannon, he will literally like forego international relations, uh, business, and like the... The, the what he wants to do and he said this openly is basically set up his family yeah. specifically Ivanka and Jared to essentially be the future rulers of America so it's a very interesting mix that he like he he has embraced a schizophrenic vision of a Trump brand mm. that I'm very curious whether this will be able to sustain itself I don't think so man in the long term because wow. Bannon and Kushner hate each other that's right and and it's like you said it, it well it's it's incompetence meets this uh, completely uh, diabolical view of the world and nafsi yeah, arrogance nafsi arrogance yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 well i mean you know we, we, um, you saw the same interview yesterday that came out where he's just like i miss my old life i had who it so good who knew who knew uh, everyone mother effort i thought it, yeah exactly <laughs> I mean, well that's his like uh, it seems like that's his excuse for everything who knew health healthcare well, was so the complicated the thing is when who knew that it's, but it's always like did you know <laughs> Did you know this is hard? Like it's. As That's why I think he's honest. I think that that was at his, like you had oh, to give Trump. Is, the, yeah. He was at his most vulnerable. Accidental and honest. Because right. he's like, yar, why mujhe nahi malum tha? Yeah. Did you really know? We're like, yes, yes, we knew. And he's like, but it's it's really. But the the actual quote, because he he kind of self edited himself because he's like, you know, I thought it would be. I'm a man for the details. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, I'm all about the and details, but still, I thought it would be dot dot dot. What? That's mm. like what? What did he? I honestly think he believed his own lies yeah. in debasement of Obama sure. and thought here was this young black whippersnapper in the office who probably doesn't do crap. I'm better than him. Mm-hmm. Who does he think mm-hmm. he is mocking me at the White House press dinner? Mm-hmm. Loki goes to golf, you know, so many times. Meanwhile, Trump, mashallah, has <laughs> golfed like literally every week at Mar-a-Lago at taxpayer's expense, a for private, uh, like literally real estate uh, like Venture of his. Venture of his, yeah. where like all of his, the top 1% hang out. Yeah. Um, and I literally think he, he kind of deluded him into himself into thinking that mm. the president, like Obama, is like this lazy black guy, this charlatan. Uh, mm. I'm better than him. Mm. And he probably has all these aides and staffs. And the president probably gets his butt kissed by everyone. He delegates to everything. Right. And, you know, probably just signs a couple of things here and there, photo ops, mean yeah. greets. The legislators do what they do. The judges do what mm. they do. The, the peons do what they do. I'll have a bunch of chumchas. And then he comes in, he's like, holy crap. Mm-hmm. And this was even before he became uh, inauguration. Remember he met Obama? That day when they were sitting next to each other. And Obama was literally like, oh my God. Like, like the, the, it leaked essentially that Trump's team had no idea yeah. that you had to replace uh, this entire the staff of, 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 of the White House. The he's like, so like, yeah. what are you guys planning to do that? Oh, we have to do that? And that's probably why Obama being 
responsible and like realizing, okay, I'm still a servant of the American people and the citizen. I can like literally abandon America to this jahil. It's like let me help you as much as I can That's before right. I go for three months and like you know. I'm like, telling rock you, out, I, rock out and I truly wonder. And then if, intro the right wing narrative of the deep state. Yeah, because that's exactly. What I, I AKA wonder though, responsible if, government. if Obama, in the back of his mind, is thinking, "Man, I should have just gone easy on him at the White House Correspondents' Dinner that one," because that's like his supervillain origin story. That's yeah, that's that like triggered him. That's they called me Mr. Glass. Yeah, that's just exactly what I was thinking. Two points, <laughs> two points for nerd nerd analogy that I understood completely. I was just waiting for you to say that. And there's gonna be a <laughs> sequel me coming. Mr. Glass, that's yeah, there is a sequel coming <laughs> called Glass. Yeah. Yes, that was what they called me. They used to call me Mr. Glass. <laughs> Like, calm down, man. You're a billionaire. They call me Mr. Glass. <laughs> For the geek deprived, rent, we are talking rent about... Rent unbreakable. Yeah, rent yeah. <laughs> unbreakable. That's Samuel right. Jackson's character yeah. at the end, who we thought was the ally of Spoiler. Bruce Willis, the superhero. It's, it's a 17-year-old Essentially, movie. It, like, reveals that he's a supervillain behind all this murderous acts. And he, like, where Bruce Willis was, like, invincible yeah. and he couldn't die... Literally, Mr. Glass was brittle. He used to break at everything. Yeah. And then he used to, like, as Bruce Willis was walking away, dejected at realizing his friend is the Joker, he said, they used to call me Mr. Glass. He's like, I did it because of the kids. Yeah. yeah. They, they called me Mr. They Glass. They called me Mr. Glass. And you can see Trump, if you look at the, the close-ups of that yeah, White House correspondent, true. he just sits there staring, yeah. seething, yeah. not yeah. moving, oh, yeah. no, getting yeah. more orange. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's part of it. But you know what someone else says? Howard Stern, who's his friend. And it, no one picks up on this because there's so much not like there's it, so much you get it's bombarded. Right? Exactly. It's Howard Stern said something really insightful. He goes, "I've known Donald Trump for 20 years. He's yeah. been my friend. He came to my wedding. He does not want to do this. He does not have the temperament to do this. He's very sensitive. Mm-hmm. He pays attention to what people, people say about say. him. This is the crowd that he covets." And he says, I don't think this will be good for his mental health based on the criticism yeah. that he's gonna get. And in fact, he probably did it as. This is amazing, and this makes a lot of sense. He did it only to convince NBC to give him a higher raise for The Apprentice. So he's like, if you're not giving me a higher raise for The Apprentice, I'm going to do this. And I guarantee you he did not think he'd win, because if you look at his haul for when he gave, from when he won, yeah. he looked more shocked than anybody. Remember yeah, that? Yeah. He really did. He the really only person did. who wasn't shocked was Bannon. And he, right. well, no, he said as much. He's, he's reversed himself, but he said, I had told my close family like we're probably gonna lose and that's and, rem- and, and being the coward now, yeah. now he's like no I, we knew right along but you can find the, the but being the coward that he was he said two days before the election the election's rigged it's rigged because he was preparing himself and his base yeah of course for an excuse for the loss but you know what's the kind of the ironic thing is when you when you look at the situation in, in everything going on right now it would have been better for him to lose and in a, in a sense, in terms of Hillary Clinton being able to accomplish anything, it might have been worse for her to win. But so we don't know, though, right? We now don't. You're, now you're playing like the, well, if you go back and kill Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> like, right, but, but I mean, for, certainly for him, because he would have cashed out on this forever. And he, he would have, like right now, he's having to work. He's a 70-year-old man who's having to work harder than he's ever had to work in his life. But the, and, well, So this is the thing, right? If... So this is... Okay, look. I'm not the, saying it's a good thing he won, by okay, the what's, what's the silver lining with him winning? Let's, let's, let's play this out. Let's play this scenario. He wins, and all the people who are like, make America great again, and were for the ideological vision of Trump and Bannon, now they get to see the failure. Yeah. And maybe, and I hate saying this because I don't want to be a sadist or a masochist, it's like you have kids. Like Zucky has four hundred children. You know, we have like we're normal people. We have like a couple. Couple. Yeah, yeah. Zucky just produces them like every week. Just like he feeds the biryani, another one comes out after midnight. Like, but they're not gremlins. They're like all like mogwais. They're cute. No, they are gremlins. They're gremlins, but they're cute, my child. They are gremlins. Yeah, but so the rest of us who are like aren't like you know breed like Zucky. You know, it's like it's like when you have kids. Sometimes. Like you warn your child, you warn your child, you warn your child, and you're like, TK, like, okay, you want to fall in the dirt? Yeah. Fall in the dirt. That's right. And I was talking to someone, like, because there's a cost to this, and, the, and will we withstand the cost? And I'm not trying to be glib here. Some people need to realize, look, this is their agenda. Yeah. They hate you. They don't care about the Rust Belt. They don't care about the lower class. Yeah. Yeah. Look at all their promises. Hot air. Look at how they lie. We told you. And you're still doing it. So now you've made me into a state rights activi- uh, advocate. I'm going to live in my blue state where we produce more, where the red states take more. That's right. And four years from now, I'm going to take my you know, Prius 
drive through your town, which is going to have crappy roads because no infrastructure, and the water, which is going to be polluted. I'll be drinking my Evian, and I'll come to your like rusted diner. I'll order a meal just to help you out, and I'll give you a forty dollar tip, and I'll ask you, "Is America great again?" That's the part of me which is like maybe that's the only way some of these people will learn. But then another part of me says, "These people will double down. They will. Sure. And yeah. we're in it for the long haul. We are. And they're like, they're not going to learn." I'm talking about the his base, which is not the majority of Americans. I'm not talking about every single Trump voter. Right. I'm talking about the the, the hardcore, the hardcore. The, everything is fake news that goes against me. Yeah. Us versus them. Mm-hmm. Zero sum mindset. The minorities are taking over. America was great again when it was 1953 before Brown versus uh, Brown, Brown versus, versus Board of, Edu- Edu- Board of Education. Mm-hmm. And when I see a Zucky or a Pervé succeed, it's not that oh, there's another seat at the table. These guys took my seat at the table. Mm. And we're seeing that in France and Netherlands. So taking that into account, I take that threat very seriously. That's right. And maybe our job is uh, cripple and contain. Contain the damage and outbreed sure. them. Uh, while moving the rest of us forward, if Clinton had won, I think this would have, you know, like we never know. But if Clinton had won, I think it would have been much better for America. All the Muslims who say this nonsense that Clinton is the same as Trump is like a dagger in my heart. I thought it was crap before. And I'm not saying that, just to be very, very clear about it. No, I know. But you know all the Muslims who said it? So many Muslims said it. And and I was like, are you insane? Mm -hmm. And they still believe that. And, And I think it wouldn't have been as bad as now, but I think they would have almost, the same base would have been galvanized even further. So putting the last thing I'll say is maybe putting the silver lining on this, if there is any. Putting them in power and seeing literally you have the executive yeah. branch. You have both houses. Yeah. You have governors. That's right. There's literally now, now no one else you can the, Now run the, the Supreme thing. Court. Now, and, yeah, and you have the Supreme Court. Now run this. Now run this. And if we can tilt 10 to 15% of his voters mm. to sanity, then we win. We win in the long run. That's right. Well, that's well in the kinda, long run, I mean, the changing demographics alone are going are, are to change the... But you're going to radicalize, you're gonna radicalize his base. <laughs> I mean, true, but, but if you shrink the base... That's kind of the point I'm saying. That's, yeah. that's the point I'm making, though, right, is that big picture, and again, like you said, this is sort of the silver lining view. Yeah. Hillary Clinton wins. We don't... We just kick the can down the curb as far as everything Trump started. Not even started. That Trump wrote, took advantage of. Yeah, 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 took advantage of the wave, yeah, yeah. right? So here it's like... Will the fever break? I don't know, but I think this is this might be the best chance we have for the fever to break because the the GOP is going to have to realize, look, we have to run things here. We have to actually get stuff done. We can't just be. You but know. see, they did an audit. See, you say that, and then let me be bad cop. Okay. Two thousand eight, <laughs> McCain Palin did sure. an audit. We lost. We got to change. In twenty twelve, they did that. They did the, auto- the autopsy. Right? Yeah. yeah. Instead, autopsy. instead, what happened? Freedom Caucus Tea Party. But they, they were still the opposition party. But though. now they're not. So now, instead of doubling down and saying, let's reach out to the Muslims, the Mexicans, the women, the the LGBT, they're like, nope, we're going to double down on non-interventionism, isolationism, white nationalism. Hmm. And it was because based on the Rust Belt and literally how the Electoral College is drawn up and gerrymandering, they just got enough. Now, you can put in different factors there. Clinton messed up with her campaign. What's her campaign slogan? Does anyone know? Do you remember? I'm with her. Okay, you're, you, most people have no idea. I'm with her. Or love Trump's hate, which is already bad because it reinforces it's, it's, Trump. His yeah. name is in America, America Great Again is amazing. What does yeah. it mean? Who knows? Yeah. Make America Great Again makes me feel awesome. She didn't visit Wisconsin. She didn't uh, Michigan, I don't think. She didn't, yeah, I've, she, been, I've been listening to this book, uh, Shattered. Have you guys heard about I mean, this? I'm, I'm about to read it. Dude, they, they destroyed her. But at the same time... Let, but let they me, destroy her campaign. It's her not campaign. just her. Yeah, but yeah, but, the, but they, they don't mince words. Yeah, I mean, it's but it, they they don't ladle the blame on her. They and they they give and they, Sanders and they the praise blame her also. They, they yeah. praise and, her and, also, and they give Sanders a portion of the blame. I mean, it's it's a it's, relatively fair. It's a multiple of, factors that led to it. Yeah. But at the same time, what I tell people is, she's despite all of her weaknesses, the mistakes that she made, plus Russia, plus Comey, plus fake news, <coughs> plus Sanders, she still wins by three million votes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right, and and Trump barely squeezes by, thanks to seventy thousand votes. Around four states. Yeah. If he, if she wins thirty-five thousand of those votes, done, halas. Um, but it goes back to the problem, and we're seeing this in Netherlands with the rise of Geert Wilders. That's right. Le Pen. Le Pen. I'm yes. taking Le Pen seriously, man. I know sure. Macron and all those yeah. Emmanuel Macron. All those people are saying. Uh, there's no way she'll win. This is like deja vu all over. Totally deja He dipped yeah. beyond, be, uh, beneath sixty yeah. percent, and she's been in this game a long time. She has. Austria. Which bear, the Nazi party, the Freedom Party, barely lost. People are like, oh, they lost, barely lost. But Wilder's lost too. 
So this is the positive. They looked at what happened with Trump, realized this is the negative side of, of, of electing a buffoon. And Brexit. And Brexit. Yeah. Lakin, you also see, this is, that's the positive. The negative is, holy crap, Le Pen is number two. Mm-hmm. Sure. And her yeah. ideas, which marginalize us in particular, yeah. Oh, yeah. Muslims and people of color, oh, yeah. are now mainstream. So is this, are we witnessing, this is a question to the audience and you guys, so like with Obama's election and Hillary Clinton banked on this, almost won but lost, multicultural pluralistic America. We are banking on the demographic de- destiny, right? Yeah. We are banking on the, the, the yeah. death rattle yeah. of white supremacy. Right. But what we're witnessing now is the death march of white supremacy. Hmm. So what's going to happen after Trump? Hmm. Is it going to go back to the rattle or is it going to go back to the march? Well, the question is, is this... Uh, you know, in, in stock terms, you call it the dead cat bounce, right? Where do, have you ever heard that term? No, it's the idea is when it bottoms out, it slightly goes up before it crashes again. The dead cat bounce. I don't know who came up with that. It's a it was two metaphor. points for Zucky for knowing a, a Wall Street. Yeah, I'm kind of uh, impressed with myself. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it a day I was, early. Actually. I was expecting a Planet of the Apes analogy. But like, <laughs> Speaking of he comes in, <laughs> oh boy, comes in with, the, yeah, with the dead cat bounce. Did you know the stock market is <laughs> a dead cat bounce? We're like, dead cat? What? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, you've impressed me. I should Google that just to make sure that is what I said because I'm going to... That is the most impressive <laughs> that is quite analogy impressive. Lucky he's I, ever made. My respect for him has actually exponentially increased. And that's why we did this show today is just so that I, I actually uh, Googled uh, uh, stock metaphors waiting. before we were... See, I was expecting like, uh, the, like the horror movie like right when you kill the yeah. boogeyman that's and right. then he comes for the last it's gas. It's like when Ripley used the, the power loader. Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. <laughs> But well, great. Anyway, go back to the dead yeah, cat sorry. bounce. No, but that's what I'm, that's what yeah. I, I. You're I, answering uh, what that's God's my I question. Hope. I, 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 I do believe which that. Which is, is I, it a rattle or a, or I, a march? I, Listen, I why know. do you believe that? Yeah. Why? Because I, when it comes down to it, I believe in the decency of the majority of people. I mean, that's that's my experience. Fifty-four percent of white America voted for Trump. And fifty-four percent right, of white women, but, white women after the yeah, Axis you know, Hollywood. You team. know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna draw on a, an experience in my own life and I, I can't remember maybe I've told this I can't remember but um, somebody who I know who was you know one of the uh, administrators at my high school and has ended I've been very close she's an older lady I've been close with her and her family for a long time and um, she before maybe a month before the election she's like I you know I just I can't vote for Hillary I'm going to vote for Trump and I was mortified I was I was crushed because mm-hmm. I was like I was like you know me. You know what he said about Muslims and this. And that. I, this is somebody who even my wife knows, and I mentioned this to my wife, and I mean, she started to cry. Like mm. it was that's how much it hurt her, you mm. know. And so I was kind of I I and this this was in the context of a Facebook conversation. So I just chimed in. I was like, well, I'm not going to tell you how to vote, but you know, Trump is somebody who's said that I'm not American enough. I'm not the right kind of American. Mm. My kids, are, you know, and I kind of laid it out, and mm. I was like, I'm not intending to change your mind, but here's what I think. Anyway. She cast her vote however she did. I'm assuming she voted for Trump. About a month later, let me, about two weeks after the election, I just ha- it just so happened that at Menlo College, I was asked to give a talk about the American Muslim experience, yeah. actually. So I posted a flyer about that on my Facebook, and she saw that picture, and she, posted, she shared it on her Facebook. Mm. Even though she doesn't live here, she lives somewhere, you know, just sharing it. And so somebody on her Facebook was like, why are you sharing... Muslim stuff like somebody who's clearly anti-Muslim and she said uh, Zeki's like family to me he's like a son to us so I don't have anything against him I don't have anything against Muslims and then her her daughter chimed in and was like you know don't don't talk bad about Muslims you don't know you know and, and so I that's a something that I really I'm carrying that with me because I yeah. truly believe that that's emblematic of the majority of Trump voters that they voted for Trump for whatever their reasons were, and they found a way to justify his, his either his sexism or mm-hmm. his racism or his ignorance, you name it. There's any number of things that would disqualify mm-hmm. him that weren't. But when it comes down to it, given something immediate, people will make the right choices. And that's, I bank on that. But you know what? I'm a, I'm a teacher. I bank on people's decency because I see that decency all the time. I see people helping each other. I see people working with each other. I see people working through their differences. And so that has sort of formulated my, my view, you know. But can I give a bad cop response to yeah, that? Please do. And now I'm not saying I disagree with you, but it's just hypothetical. Those same people, their need 
to feel great again. Yes. Their need to feel safe. Their need to have the illusion of greatness hmm. came at the expense and the marginalization of millions of their fellow Americans. And True. when doing the balancing test, I agree with you. Many Trump supporters, I, I talk to them, they don't have horns on their heads, they don't have tails, they're not shaitan incarnate, pretty nice people. They said, yeah, I see what you're saying, Zaki, the Muslim son of immigrants who eats Mexican taco food, which is halal. But... That's all what? on my business card, by the way. But, but you know what? Not enough for me. <laughs> Still going to go for Trump. Yeah. yeah. And which that's, is my experience. With yeah, this and that's something where which we have to contend with. And I think moving forward, uh, there's like, okay, so this is my, like, we're doing hypotheticals. But look, I agree with you. I'm the optimist as well. And like taking from the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallam, like, you know, he could have easily come back to Mecca when he did after years of being oppressed, exiled. Yeah. When he and returned he, victorious. Yes, he returned victorious right. and he had the upper hand yeah. strategically. If I was his counselor, and this is why I, I, would, I should never be a Sahaba and never will be, I'd be like, kill these mother effers. <laughs> Prophet Muhammad said, get that one. Remember that one? Kill him. Let <laughs> me well, kill him. Did, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Can I strangle him? Yeah. Which is why I'm never going to be a Sahabi and I hope <laughs> one day to get in the Jannat. Uh, but strategically, that's a smart move yeah, to make. That's right. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. If you were like an advisor to a king and you said you're coming back and you're in hostile territory where these people will probably turn against you because they have in the back, murder them. Mm -hmm. Instead, which is very pivotal, and I try to learn from this uh, and many other examples, is he instead responded in a better way, appealed to their better nature, and through time, won over most. Some of them were still hypocrites. Right. And I think we're in an interesting situation where, and if I, you know, it's a, it's a podcast where you guys get Muslimy. I think Muslims as American oh. citizens and as people who are literally placed at the fault lines <laughs> of many of the discussions and topics that will shape the future of America. I mean, if you think about it, we're now a major player. That's right. Whether or not we're going to be used as a token, uh, a stereotype, a club by other people, or whether or not we're going to actually emerge to control our own narrative, it remains to be seen. I hope the latter, because the former is being done unintentionally by some people as well. Oh, we're going to piggyback on the Muslims. Mm -hmm. You guys fight the fight. Sure. African Americans have been doing this their entire lives, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> um, but if we can invest some of that spiritual Meaning carrying knowledge. piggybackers, not, piggybackers. Uh, not piggybacking on... They, yeah, no, they yeah. just want to they, clarify. Yeah yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so my take is this. We, we are in a position now where if we can resist and fight and be strategic and, and you know acknowledge those folks who probably will always want our marginalization, contain them, but then use our better natures hmm. and our spiritual culture and etiquette and histories mm. to heal hearts... That's where I want to move us forward. And I know I've pivoted the conversation, but what concerns me, what concerns me deeply is this new, this new form of progressive and even conservative activism, which is completely devoid of spirituality. Yeah. Mm. And I'm deeply I, troubled by this and for is, my children. It's funny that no, you, I am because I had wanted to yeah, pivot I, in this direction. Exactly. So, so thank you. Thank you no, very but like, much. You know, how no, do we, I, so how do we pivot? Because like, you have, like, look, your friend, she went to bed for you. Yeah. She's not shaitan. Even though she voted for Trump, what do you do with her? Uh, is there a space in your mental, spiritual imagination for a community that includes people who disagree with you? What do you do to people who disagree with you? Do you treat them in a good way, uh, a decent way, or my way or the highway? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, this is just the conversation I'm trying to have is this type of activism that I see, especially with fake news, with media, with social media, with Facebook, with Twitter. My way or the highway? Uh, screw you. Uh, uh, my way at all costs, absolutism, and you're a kafir, a sellout, or a whore if you go against me. Mm -hmm. And 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 I, I just want to make sure yeah, yeah. you're speaking specifically about activism within the Muslim community. I think in general. In general, but let's just, if you could, if we could, you know, lean in even further and speak specifically about activism within the Muslim community. Yeah. Would you say that that is sort of indicative of and um, yeah, indicative of? what is happening I see Islam being used primarily as an identity marker which yes. is perfectly fine and I see us using the Muslim label to of course as a political instrument which is fine but I see no spiritual I don't see the spiritual engine behind it I don't see a spiritual flavoring behind it and, and yes within Muslim communities I'm deeply concerned based on how I see certain types of activism on college campuses, on social media in particular, 
devoid of that warmth. And, yeah. and you can speak to this. And, and That's I'd what I'm like saying. What Yahad is, I think, almost you, uniquely because you qualified to speak on, on this. Because you've been on the front yeah. lines, if you will, of yeah. this, of, of quote-unquote Muslim activism because 9-11 sort of put you on the front line. MSA That's president, right? Yeah. Yeah. MSA president told the story. Or something. Yeah. yeah, refer back to the previous episode with, with, with Wajahat yeah. where he talks so, about that. But, so, yeah. so from then to now, I mean, you've, you've, from then to, you've literally gone gray watching <laughs> the changes, you know. I have gone gray, even in my views have gone gray. Because I was, the gray, yeah. I was part of that type of <laughs> yeah. absolutist, all or nothing, oh, yeah. there you go. rah, rah, rah. Yeah. Anyone who disagrees with you is like either like a sellout. If someone is more aggressive than you, they're an extremist. Mm-hmm. If someone's not as aggressive as you, they're a sellout. Mm-hmm. There is one way to do something. That's right. If you work in corporate America, you're a sellout. If you work in the government, you're a sellout. If you do X, you're a sellout. If you're an activist, you're a lefty sellout. Do you see what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Um, and this type of absolutism and this type of uh, absolutist language we see manifested on a national skill with, 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 with what's happening in America. We've already discussed, touched upon in the last 30 minutes. But within Muslim communities, you know, there's only one way to be an authentic Muslim. This is the way. And if you don't do it, you're a sellout. And first of all, I think it's strategically unwise and unsound. Uh, Number two, when political ideologies and slogans become the defining aspect of your Islamic identity, it scares me. Yeah. Because I'm like, dude, this is not the sixth pillar of my Islam. Like, no offense whatever your political ideologies are, right? like you. whether you're pro-Bernie or pro-Clinton or Thank like, you. like this, I haven't given Bea to <laughs> Sheikh Bernie or Sheikh Clinton or Sheikh Trump. Yeah. I mean, like, seriously. Right, right, absolutely. And, and, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm motivated by morals and values. Yeah. And as such, that's what's going to guide me. Uh, and then when we see people turn to each other, right? Mm-hmm. And, and then I see specifically like this type of, like even if you see like now most Muslims are quote unquote progressive, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. Well, what are you doing to reach out to people in the Rust Belt? Yeah. Or those who are might agree with you eight out of ten times, but two out of the ten times they don't agree with you. But I, I, but let's talk about that for a moment. When you say most Muslim activists, let's say, are progressive, and we don't have statistics, maybe whether that that, that would it's necessarily validate it. But I think it was. I think it, 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 it seems sound. It, it seems pretty sound. Exactly. We went from a community that not even 20 years ago was lock, stock, and barrel Republican. Right. Lock, stock, and barrel. Block we voted. voted. Block voted in 2000. Except, except, except black Muslims. Except black Muslims, no doubt. That, this is, but I, I would also uh, push back, in, or not push back, but, but, but just sort of say that the, the reason I'm talking about the immigrant community is because I think a lot of the uh, the, the kind of new activism that we're seeing are it's, it's children, of, immigrant, immigrant, it's it's children immigrant. of immigrants. People like you and I. People like the three of us here. So... What concerns me more is this, like you said, the absolutism and all that stuff, which I think has been there since you and I were in the trenches, and I'm probably even older than you, so back in the day, you know, back in those early People days People listen to this well. thing, we're like on our deathbed. <laughs> right like but no, no, three, be people, three who, does. people who came, who emerged into the activist scene vis-a-vis MSA yeah, yeah, yeah. on the college campus. That's what I mean. Which was not entirely spiritually healthy, I would say. Yeah, exactly. But... Would you say that there was at least some sort of level of, 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 of literacy about Islam that predicated you, or upon which you predicated your activism? Should I, I say? Do you want to lean in so, so much that we like kiss the microphone? I think one of the great dangers, and I've had conversations with people who are activists themselves. There, and that's activists. why I, I say you're uniquely there's qualified, no, not because look, you're demonstrative of that. There's, we don't have spiritual literacy. Yes. Hmm. There is a huge deficit of spiritual literacy amongst our activist communities and our activists. For our activists, God bless them, and for our community leaders and organizers yeah. around the, the trenches. But you know what they tell me, man? They're like, yeah. I'm spiritually drained. I'm not really that religious. Mm-hmm. People expect me to do X, Y, and Z. My love life's a mess. Hmm. Uh, I don't get to spend time with my kids. And yet now you have to pose as a s- superhero when you don't have the, either the spiritual literacy, the grounding, the tarbiyat, or the community to help you. Then we get to these MSAs, it's politics first, politics second, politics third, politics fourth, politics fifth, spirituality maybe never. Yeah. But, you know, I was just reading the other day on, on, uh, uh, about, uh, I want to say this was an article, about somebody who was ahead of an MSA who realized or came to a, a realization in their heart that they didn't believe in the faith and they were atheists yeah that's a lot of them and yeah. they felt still compelled to be MSA president yeah 
Yeah. Which, look, who am I and to I'm, judge I'm anyone, right? I'm not well, no, judgment but, on that, but... It, it reminds me, in, in this context, and, and I've been I've been thinking about this uh, for... Uh, and Which is why I'm glad you went where you went, which, I had, which is... Is an, there's an amorphism by, um, you know, uh, Dr. T.J. Winters, um, Abdul Hakim Murad, which to the effect says that the, that, that the new kalima or the new, um, you know, article, uh, the <laughs> testimony of faith, I think, yeah. Yeah, the new testimony of faith of the Muslim advocates is, a- advocate is... A- not, not the organization, sorry, not the organization, not the organization, sorry. <laughs> They're fine. The Muslim activist is that there is no God, but, uh, I'm sorry, there is no religion but Islam and that Muhammad is the messenger of Islam kind of parse that if you will mm. where again it's a religion void of God I, it's a I religion see. Okay. void of, I got of, of spirituality if you will yeah. of connecting with the divine it's religion for political expediency yeah, it's, it's, it's religion for as a political idea it's a religion identity. as it's religion as a political vehicle where politics are in the driver's seat and religion is in the passenger seat and spirituality is barely hanging on like T-1000 with its hook in the back like like dra- being dragged around that's right great, yeah. and which is fu- some people say that's what I want which is fine right. but I'll give in context right. look at no, but I'm sorry. You, you were you were talking about the MSA scene. No, and I think that's right. No, no, it's, it's true, man. But look, even like go back the reason that. why it's important is look. If you look at civil rights movement, yes, you had diversity of African American experiences, but you can't discount the fact of religious Religion. communities and spirituality and Martin Luther King and John Lewis, uh, regardless of their foibles in life. You know, Martin Luther King and whatnot. But still, mm. they spoke with a religious language and a spiritual language which healed hearts. Oh, absolutely. Malcolm X. Malcolm X. Gandhi, despite whatever. Still, like do you see? I'm saying there's so much power. When you draw authentically from our religious texts and fuse it with mm-hmm. spirituality, that moves hearts to this day. There's a reason why even the most watered down Rumi translation by Coleman Barks are like one of our one wins for Muslims, <laughs> right? And I tell Muslims this, I think about it, like, listen, suppose you have a friend, Muslim, non-Muslim, atheist, whatever, and they're like, listen, man, I just need emotional healing. I just need someone to help me. Hmm. I know with like the Buddhists, I can go to the Dalai Lama, there's like a rabbi I can go to, like who would I send them? Like, can you name me five Muslims who I'm sending to just for spiritual healing who can just talk to me and make me feel like a better human? I'm like, dude, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, ask a friend. I think that's deeply problematic. I, yes. Like, you know, I think the fact that we have abandoned a deep spiritual tradition which can heal hearts and, and, and motivate people and win people over uh, what we've seen through 1,400 years of civilization. Like, I'll give you one quick example. Like, India. Uh, you go to this day to India, uh, you go to Ajmer Sharif, there's a langar where they feed people daily. Uh, that langar was established by Muinuddin Chishti. Mm. Uh, the great Sufi the saint. The great Sufi saint who went there as like literally a pauper was given a, uh, he said, a given an order to go there. And literally he said, my entire job was to serve people. Mm. I served my enemies. I served idolaters. I served people who were poor. I just served people I, I, and I served humanity. And then to this day you go there no one talks smack about Muslims. If you talk smack about Muslims, especially like Ahl Bayt, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or uh, Ajmer, like if you talk about uh, Khaja Gharib, Nawaz, Mohini, and Chishti, Sikhs and Hindus will beat you up. Oh, yeah. I'm just giving you an ex- example, like what sustains you. Yeah, exactly. I think politics, Muslim, I'm talking about our communities in particular. Yeah. Politics without that spiritual engine is like a hollow husk. And I see people burning out, and I'm afraid for our communities who get burned out. And if you use Islam purely as a political bludgeon, mm. I'm using the word bludgeon, my way or the highway, hmm. uh, I worry what that does to the religion. I worry what that does to religious communities. Mm. And I hope, and this is a test for all of us, man. I just hope if we draw into that spiritual well and get that spiritual literacy and infuse that with our politics, I actually think you'll have more Americans uh, who will come to you. And I say this to progressives. I said this last week. It was like... Uh, being interviewed and like a non-Muslim just a progressive thing I'm like you guys cede the ground of religion to the right wing the right wing has cynically used it successfully that's right uh, to mobilize so many Americans of faith whereas we as people of faith are on this moral high ground on most of these issues hmm. and yet you mock us and ridicule us where you're missing out allies and whereas religion and spirituality spirituality are used authentically as a language to articulate much of our problems mm. dude you can mobilize so many people mm. and I think heal people and I think this is where like, listen, man, let's just be honest. Like, you have the Ikhwani card being played. You have the Salafi card being played. You got the Deobandi card being played. You have the pro Erdogan card being played. You have the anti Erdogan card being played. Awesome. All politics, for the most part. Yeah. Uh, Agreed. And so, like, what just, where is that spiritual harmony in humanity that exists within Islam that will allow you to be like Prophet Muhammad 
to go back as king, but not murder the people who tried mm. to murder you. In fact, pardon the people who hired assassins to kill your uncle, and then they came and ate your uncle's liver, and you pardoned them. Yeah. If indeed that is our model as Muslims, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, do you see that type of love, compassion, forgiveness modeled by our leaders? I'll throw it out to you and Zaki. And ourselves. I can be better. I need to be better. Well, I think, I think my, my response would be, I, maybe it's for the best that this is something that we're sort of, I mean, it's just something that we're going to have to work through. Uh, in the public sphere, and yeah. you know, I, I think I think that what we've seen in in the last uh, using nine eleven as a rough starting point from from then to now, we've seen an emergence of what what it means to be a Muslim in America, and what you know, and that's the, the, a dichotomy that we've talked about on this show a lot. And I think you know, there, there's going to be people redefining that or mm. or defining that at all. I think. That there's a healthy aspect to all of that right. potentially. I mean, the, I think I think this the the notion of of uh, the the lack of spirituality is something real, but I think that's that's something that people are just gonna have to find on their own to some extent. Fine with that. I agree with that. Yeah. Uh, but to your, I mean, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know how to respond to that. I mean, I, I think there are people who kind of demonstrate that spirit, but I mean, I'm not here to like drop names specifically or give examples. But I, I mean, I think there I are. I'm like, asked anyone. Yeah, 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 exactly. Everyone's exactly. on a journey. Right. Every, there's, there's, but there's, but I, I took I, a bird's eye view of this. I know, and, and, and I think that. it's a very apt view. I, 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 I do, and it reminds me again in this context of uh, something that I remember Professor Jackson remarking right, I think right after 9/11. And, and he was talking about how pre 9 11 the Muslim community was a, a, a you know was an ideological play, playground, mm. and I think now what 16 years since 9 11, I think we still live in that same not the same ideological playground. We've just traded the Ikhwan. I mean, people still play the Ikhwan Salafi, uh, you know, his with Tahrir card or whatever was the case pre 9 11. That's still there now. But we've tried. We, I think we've 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 also seen the emergence of a new kind of ideological playground where so what I find fascinating is where things that used to be glacial within the Muslim community in terms of like coming to terms with okay what are what, what do we as a community feel on issue X or issue Y or issue Z right <coughs> things would and, and and it became almost like a, by way of like a joke where it was like okay you, you, you know you go to like 10 Muslim conferences and at every Muslim conference, the question was, is music permissible? Mashallah. Is it is it permissible the, to vote? The heavy-duty questions, right, the right, existential right, yeah, questions. Yeah, existential questions. <laughs> but, no, no, it's fine. So, and, 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 I, and, and you almost <laughs> was like, like you, I mean, you were, you were sick and tired of it, and you were just like, can't we get past these issues? Well, I think we have gotten past a, yeah. a lot of these issues. Yeah, sure. yeah. But what's happened, though, <clears throat> is we've traded it for this sort of expediency on, 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 on things that are far more complicated than is music permissible. So, for example, or is voting haram? Or is no, voting, sure. m- it's the late voting 90s. haram? Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, calculation <clears throat> versus moon sighting, uh, etc. I mean, add ad nauseum. Right? Those are the oldies the now. That's, That's like what I mean. You bust the oldies. That out, you know. <laughs> but now I feel he's traumatized. Though, like yeah, us. But now I feel as though, like, <laughs> to go back to the point about how Muslim advocates largely um, uh, activists. Why do I keep yes. saying that? We have nothing that? against the Muslim advocates, a nonprofit <laughs> based in the Bay Area. They're good doing work. good work. Bervais <laughs> seems to hate you, but Zaki and I don't. I don't. We don't know what happened. We so, don't what's happening between you and Perez. We hope it's amicable. We hope you work it out. <laughs> Have some chai, work it out. Go to Shalimar's, break some bread. Muslim I'm advocates. So I'll be sorry, to- Farhana, Fatima, team, Humer. I love you guys. No, nothing. Okay, Muslim activists, <laughs> activists who are progressive, is that <clears throat> we have embraced the pro- the the progressive agenda, as it were. The the With broader progressive the broader agenda. progressive agenda, capital P, let's say, right without really having conversation within our own, like within our own, say, intelligentsia. Funny you say that because I have a New York Times article coming about that next week. Oh, nice. Well, and we just go. embraced it, you know, <clears throat> yeah, literally just without a this. real conversation. Where, where, like, where were the conversations around Muslims and, and or Islam and LGBTQ uh, issues? Where was the conversation around Islam and issue whatever, right? 
Well, so maybe so with that please. in mind, you can kind of. So yeah, the, the, the question the question is. Is that what your New York Times? Well, it was basically it was, it was to examine this, right? Okay. So basically, it's it's written and the editor likes it, so inshallah, it should be out within a week or two. Wonderful. Um, by default, the Republican Party has vomited us, despite as you articulated, the Im- immigrant Muslims for the most part voted for it. Absolutely. You know, a lot of us love the tax breaks that they gave, uh, the use and abuse of God and religion, and morality. Let's be honest, yeah. really appeal to our parents. There you uh, go. Pro. Okay, we're pro-life, even though we're very libertarian on this issue. We're like, okay, pro-life, anti-gay marriage, all this stuff worked. <clears throat> and also, hard, tough on crime, yeah. go against the blacks. Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. Hmm. We're on drugs. Yeah, we're all This was pre-9-11. Yeah. We're not black. Then post-9-11, oh, crap. <laughs> we're still not black. We're not white we either. Empathize. We're not white either, right? Um, and we never will be. And I mean, now, uh, with, 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 the, with the, the narrative journey of this conversation, right, they, mm. the Republican Party has doubled down and, in fact, has used us as the piñata, along with undocumented immigrants, to assert part of their agenda yeah. uh, so now are we progressive by default mm. where most of us now feel like we have to go to Democrat party hmm. well what does that mean well what does even Democrat mean or progressive mean this is being investigated right now by Bernie Bernie brothers and Clinton and That's everyone right. else right but A will we allow ourselves to be used as a vehicle or a club or a pawn by political parties like we did with the Republican parties right. are we allowing ourselves to be used by progressive parties right. And have we had these conversations not only with progressive but also within ourselves that, well, suppose I'm, and this was what the article teases out, yeah. suppose I have traditional social values. Yeah. I, you know, I'll give you an example which triggered some Muslims. Uh, progressives mocked and ridiculed Mike Pence for saying he's not going to have dinner with someone else who's not his wife. Yeah. I have a lot of Muslim friends who are like, dude, I have female coworkers, but my culture and my understanding of my spiritual, spirituality is that I respect my wife and I feel uncomfortable to have dinner one-on-one with a woman, not because I disrespect the woman, but I'm coming from a religious place where, like, you know, I'm just not that, it's not, I'm not kosher with it. That's right. It's out of respect. That's right. And so I had some friends who were like, look how they mocked and ridiculed us. Like, I'm not down with progressives, but mm. where else am I going to go? Yeah. Secondly, <laughs> suppose, let's talk about the gays. The gays. <laughs> okay, I'm fine with gay marriage, but if you're asking me to do a progressive litmus test, and say that I have to say gay marriage is halal in Islam and that's the only way you'll accept me as a progressive, I don't know if I'm down with that. Thank you. If you say mm. I'm pro-choice, we're very libertarian on this issue, yeah. most Muslims are, but if you say that you have to say yeah. that like abortion is acceptable and you have to do it, I don't think I'm down with that. Or some progressives, you mock and ridicule people of faith. We're not monkeys, we're not stupid, we're very sophisticated. And you allow people like Bill Maher to be yeah. at least one of the leaders of one form of liberalism. There you well, go. I find him to be extreme in his views of Islam. Where, do I, where am I going to fit in? Hmm. And this is a conversation which I think where I want Muslims to not be sidekicks and stereotypes. There you go. This is where I feel like if they're using our poster in the million, uh, you know, Women's March. Sure. If, the, 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 the woman with the hijab on. Yeah. Uh, if they're Khizr Khan's beating up Donald Trump with the Constitution, mm. uh, you know, if Hasan Minaj and other of our friends are doing this, A, alhamdulillah, the tent is being opened, you're welcoming us. But are we the protagonist of that narrative? Are we side by side helping allies? Are we carrying their water? Are they carrying our water? And what's the litmus test, of, if any? And this is the question for Muslims. Because I said the same thing question I'll give for Republicans. What will come to a point? What's your breaking point? Yeah. Where progressives, whatever they be, or Democratic Party says, we'll accept you. But you have to say, you have to give up the Palestinian cause. Hmm. We'll accept you. But you have to celebrate and embrace gay sex, gay marriage, gay everything. We'll accept you. Nothing against gay sex. I'm just giving you examples, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. For the gay Muslims listening. I'm just giving you, and they know this too. They've lived through this right. from both angles, right? right? Three angles. People of color being LGBT and Muslim. Yeah. Uh, we'll accept you, but you have to condemn ISIS all the time. We'll accept you, mm. but you have to fight against FGM all the time. Mm-hmm. We'll accept you, but then you have to say that the Quran is not the word of God and reform it. Now, this is what I'm worried about. I find many Muslims who have now taken on progressive and progressive politics as their identity say, well, okay, okay, I'll jettison X, Y, and Z. Exactly. And suppose you, Purvey, say, I don't want to jettison X and Y, mm-hmm. but I'm still progressive. Mm-hmm. Will they accept you? That's right. Wow. And that's the article. 
that's, that's well, and and you you don't you don't know when that's coming. Probably but. within two weeks. Okay, so so by the time you're listening to this, uh, uh, it no, it'll 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 still be coming. So we have so we got uh, you know let's see what happens with the final edit. But I interviewed uh, Keith no. Ellison. I interviewed um, uh, an actress who's Pakistani Muslim LG, lesbian who talks about how she gets it from both progressives and Muslims. I, I interviewed uh, Shahid uh, Aman Allah who's been on your podcast before. I interviewed an African American imam. I uh, interviewed a, a Republican who turned Democrat. So I tried to get, uh, I tried to get like the nice. Yeah. But these exactly what I mentioned Absolutely. across the board. Kind of a sampler seem, seem to be the concerns. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Wow. Can't okay. wait for that piece. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Um, well, I, and uh, we're just about at the end of our time. So, uh, I, first of all, I want to thank you so much for coming on. Oh my gosh, this is this is we, uh, we've been trying to get you back on, and this has been worth the wait. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Thank so wait, wait, so we much. went from uh, Pervez uh, murdering uh, Zucky with passive aggressive Heather by the uh, daggers. Yeah. Pervez trying to murder well, Muslim we started advocates. With Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> yeah, Laverne and Shirley. Three's company. Yeah, Laverne and Shirley. Passive aggressive Heather by the anger. <laughs> Potential. If we were ISIS, what we would be. Yeah. Uh, Trump's hundred days. Muslim spirituality and Muslim progressive. That's good. Yeah. yeah. Thank cool. you for that nice little roadmap. <laughs> I of, know. Of where have we, where we been? Uh, but in terms of where you've been, my friend, uh, last we left our listeners, you were uh, you were at you were at Al Jazeera. He was yeah. at Al Jazeera. Yeah. So maybe you know we're not going to make this into a narrative episode, but just kind of tell us where you've been since then my life and is where crazy you are now, now and uh, where you are planning so, plan to be so next so year. He, he has two kids now, or as I call him, amateur. Yeah, yeah, amateur. <laughs> so Zach is like, wait till the sixty seventh, then call me. Zucky's children could populate, like literally. You see the end of Interstellar; they just sent Zucky's kids with Anne Hathaway. <laughs> <laughs> the camera didn't pan right. If the camera pan right, was Zucky with all his kids to repopulate the, the rest of humanity. Uh, it's true, though. Uh, Al Jazeera worked out well for the time being. Yeah. One day we should come on and I'll tell you the, I'll do an audit of Al Jazeera and how it failed. Oh, that'd be great. It's a great, great story. Now that we're removed enough, I could tell you what went wrong. Mm. Alhamdulillah, well, well, life works out. Six months before Al Jazeera America pulled the plug, my contract was up. Shahid Amanla, who was a guest of yours, and Quentin Viktorovitz poached me and invited me. They said, listen, we're starting the social entrepreneurial hub called the Finnis Labs. I was the first, like, halal guinea pig in their first hackathon mm. and our idea like won the people's choice award and they said like listen we just literally they're like we want to just help people and muslim change agents and muslim entrepreneurs we got stuck in the government sector we're not in the private sector come help us out so i've been there for a year alhamdulillah we've worked with facebook and google and undp and done some a lot of good initiatives but that's one job the night job is i signed a contract it sounds much better than it does but pakistani uncles love it new york times op-ed contributor which just eight to ten articles a year uh, or more and Hamla, my editors really like me and so I pitched I literally pitched this Muslim progressive thing they're like that sounds like a great idea and I ran with it so uh, is that your space kind of the Muslim American no I can do a lot of stuff oh, so they have one they have one and they want me to like they, she said you can do the Muslim stuff and American stuff but you're also a dad and you do a lot of funny stuff about being a dad and a husband can you write about that I said awesome that's fantastic uh, so I have a Father's Day piece coming out uh, also in June Father's Day is in June right Yes. Uh, See, I don't know. Our, our macham and station is so low. Yeah, like, we don't even know. Don't even, know. Yeah. even Father's Day becomes Mother's Day, as it should, <laughs> because mothers do everything. It's true. <clears throat> I can vouch. That will get me three husband equity points. Huffington Post do a couple of stuff for them. That's, you know, they they invited me to come and do videos for them during the campaign trail. Yeah. That worked out well. Good stuff. Speaking agency that turned out well. I'm finally going to write a book. Wow. Which, uh, so I'm going to start in May, inshallah. I owe, I owe my agent a book. And fiction. Then, <clears throat> nonfiction first. Okay. Then fiction. And then, you know, consulting has taken off. The one good thing I'll say is, and this is for readers to have hope, because we try to, like, be honest, and listeners, excuse me, to have hope, is we are at a remarkable fault line uh, for America, dude, where I think crisis breeds opportunity, and our faith commands us to be hopeful, even in the darkest of days. We should always be hopeful. Like, you're seeing people reach out to Muslims. You're mm-hmm. seeing people care. You're seeing people empathize. You're seeing people who want to help us. Like, we should take this opportunity. But if we sit on our butts and do nothing, like, don't expect anything to change. And I said this at the open. I was speaking like an hour ago. We're living literally, and this is the last thing I'll say is that my uncle, and I'm an uncle, so I get to give like uncle declarations and khutbahs. <laughs> like, everyone's waiting for someone to help them. And I'm yeah. like, you are the most privileged community of Muslims, like top five on earth. That's right. Living in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley with seven of the top ten 
most wealthy zip codes in America. Everyone's looking to you mm. to solve the problem. Hmm. If you're telling me that as one of the most privileged people on earth, you are unable to come up with a solution, we should just kill ourselves. Like immediately, don't kill yourself. Uh, but literally, it's like, it's that, right. it's that pivot point in our lives. And I had a conversation with a friend of ours our age. He's like, dude, like I have an idea for like media empowerment. Like what, like, Who's going to do it? I'm like, you're going to do, do it. it. You're going to fund it, and I'm going to give you the idea. Hmm. And he's like, whoa, we're like our parents. You're like, yep, we're like our parents. Our parents came here. They were waiting for their parents to come in and help. They realized no help's going to come. The cavalry is deported. Uh, <laughs> we're the ones making the masjids. We're the, they're the ones who made the masjids. They're the ones who made the halal butcher shops. We're the ones making the scholarships now. We're the ones who have to run for local office. We're the ones who have to join the ACLU. Yeah. We're the ones who have to come up with an amazing legal case that can change the face of America. We're the ones who have to encourage our children to become storytellers. We're the ones who have to direct the movie. We're the ones who have to use all of our money and literally lure the politicians to do what we want because that's how the game works. That's true. And we're the ones who have to emerge as protagonists of the American narrative. Right. And if you sit on your sidelines, we have failed our generation and failed Zucky's 642 kids. It's true. And, and they're, they're, they'll judge you. And we're the ones who have to make the best podcast in history. So, yeah, there we go. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll just, echoing yeah. what you said, I mean, and this is something you posted about before. I mean, uh, when you talk about progress in, in areas of representation, I mean, you bought a Riz Ahmed Star Wars action figure oh, yeah. for your kid, yeah. you know, and I, I got to experience that with my kids. We're, I'm watching Star Trek uh, Deep Space Nine with my kids, and there's Dr. Bashir. Yeah. yeah. And I said, you know, that he's, that's, his name is Dr. Bashir, and my, my eight-year-old, he said, really? that's, his, that's his name on the show? His name on the show? Like, couldn't believe it, you know? And, and uh, granted, that show is like 20 years old, but the truth is that these little things, just, just seeing representation, seeing that you're, you are a part of the tapestry and that you were, your narrative is uh, consequential mm. uh, I think uh, you know I, I think we will see the dividends of it and uh, I, I, I will end on an optimistic note because I think that uh, there are good things ahead as long as we keep our wits about us dude we're mashallah we're the most privileged people on earth sitting in a Silicon Valley convention center after we just had coffee uh, where Pakistani Muslim entrepreneurs are celebrating their success yeah. and we're able to launch this podcast and so life is still good compared right. to most people. That's right. There we go. And so, Wajahat, if people are, are looking for you online, I know you have a very healthy social media presence. Where can people find you? At Wajahat Ali. I just wanted to say that. Uh, on Twitter. Uh, that's it. You could just Facebook me. Fo follow him on Twitter if you aren't already. You're going to get yeah. fascinating insights, great articles. I'm very easy to reach for the most part. Yeah. But don't take advantage of that. Bastards. He's, he's a good guy. <laughs> uh, thank you, Wajahat. And uh, Pervez, you want to close this out? Yeah, no, I, I echo Zucky's sentiment. Uh, thank you, and it was such a treat to As have well you, you back. Should. Yeah, it a good sentence. <laughs> Wait, do you still hate Muslim advocates? <laughs> we... Let's clarify. <laughs> For the record, I do not have anything against Muslim advocates. They do great work. Um, but no, thank you, Wajahat, for being on. It, it, it was it was great, amazingly insightful, humorous, and, uh, and everything and, and, and everything in between. And there's a preview yeah. of more to come because uh, you've you've teased what you're going to talk about on your next appearance. There you so go. We, we there you go. Counting the down full for scoop that. on Al Jazeera. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, thank you for listening. And if you want to find us online, uh, you can uh, uh, reach us on facebook.com slash diffuse congruence. You can email comments, suggestions, questions our way, diffuse congruence at gmail.com. And you can find us wherever you find your fine podcasts, such yeah. as Stitcher Radio and Google Play and iTunes. And you name And Pervez is on Twitter at yeah. uh, uh, some long title right. that I can't remember. And I'm, I'm at uh, Zeki's Corner, Z-A-K-I-S Corner. That's also It's like the AP there. interview with Donald but Trump. There's like a lot of parts that are it's, inaudible. It's inaudible. <laughs> it's and, inaudible. And inaudible is your... <laughs> yeah. That's basically... Is that what he was doing? Yeah. Right. Wait, who's, who's, wait, it's the final question. So who's Archie Punjabi and who's Juliana Margulies? <laughs> I, well, I don't know. I, I mean, contended you're Archie. I'll, I'll take it. She uh, seems like a nice person. <laughs> Mashallah. What does your better do? He's the Archie Punjabi of podcasts. What the hell has your son done? <laughs> and with that, thanks with for that. listening. This has been Diffuse Congruence. <laughs>